Hey, it's Dr. Crone again. Welcome to our last video in this course on gender and politics. Remember, this is the second of two videos in our unit on race, ethnicity, and gender. So much like the concept of race in the previous video we looked at, the concept of gender and how it's defined and understood has enormous political consequences for women. And there are basically two ways to conceptualize gender. Uh, there's biological determinism, and then there's the conceptualization of gender as a social construct. So this is very similar to the conceptualization of race. So let's look at each of these. So biological determinism is clearly the most historic uh, way of looking at gender. Um, and a lot of uh, the idea here is that biological sex characteristics are equivalent to gender. So when we think of gender, what we think of are the genetic and reproductive characteristics of a particular human being. Um, and the reason this has had so many political consequences is because of um, a conception that something about those genetic reproductive characteristics um, makes women less, um, less able to function in society and less able to function in the political world. Um, and so there's a notorious uh, study by uh, two British uh, researchers in 1889 who said that um, because of biology and essentially um, women are uh, women and men the theory of Geddes and Thompson is that women and men um, their personality traits reflect their uh, reproductive cells so women are sluggish inactive and naturally uninterested in politics because they are like their egg cells which are large and not particularly active and men are like their sperm cells, meaning that they, the superior activity, uh, quote, uh, of the male cell, sperm, is reflected in the male character. So this idea was men are like sperm, and so therefore they're naturally going to be very active and moving around and very, un, in, very interested in politics and engaged in the world. Women are not going to be that way. And that's probably the ultimate political argument for uh, discrimination against women and um, and this idea has led to political consequences all over the place um, including the idea that women are either mentally or biologically unsuited to vote they're unsuited to run for office they're unsuited for participation in economic life um, they're you know their their childbearing uh, characteristics make them uh, tie them to home and to family and so they can't be successful in these other places um, and just one example of that in the United States was that in terms of economic success was that the women had a very hard time getting credit um, before a, a law was passed in the early 1970s uh, women did not have access to credit on their own. And in many cases, if they wanted to take out a loan or buy a house or something like that, they had to have a male co-signer for that loan. Um, and that actually happened to my mother when she tried to buy a car in the early 1950s. She was a teacher. She had a teaching position and a college degree, only one in her family with a college degree. But um, the bank made my uh, grandfather co-sign for the loan. And was kind of interesting because he had an eighth grade education and was a mostly unemployed plumber at the time and she was basically supporting the family with her salary um so uh lots and lots of political consequences we could we could have a whole class on on gender and politics just in the united states i wish we had time for that uh, but this biological determinism really does have an impact on women's ability to um you know sort of participate in society at large and particularly in politics um, so m much more recently there's been the notion that uh, gender is really a social construction that at the heart of it um, is influenced by biological sex characteristics but that that is not really what determines um, the characteristic behaviors and traits of what a society says is you know appropriate for the female or male gender 
So the idea here is that we define gender starting with those biological sex characteristics, but that what they do is not lead directly to behavior like Geddes and Thompson said, but rather they lead to socialization into culturally defined gender roles. So when we look at a baby, a boy baby, uh, we dress them in blue, we buy them trucks and hammers. Uh, when we look at a girl baby, we dress them in pink, we buy them dolls and, and little animals to take care of and things like that. Um, and that that socialization consciously or unconsciously uh, leads into uh, the presentation of gender appropriate behaviors and traits. So if you are a girl with girl sex characteristics and uh, you've been uh, socialized to understand that women uh, have children and defer to their husbands, uh, then you will present more like more than likely present those gender appropriate traits, not because you have the biological sex characteristic. So that idea of social constructionism can be very empowering for uh, women's political equality when a society moves from seeing um, gender as biologically determined to seeing it more as a social construct because social constructs can change, uh, whereas biological sex characteristics are difficult to change. So when we look at inequality around the world, I don't think I have to tell you that women have been discriminated against pretty much in every country there is uh, for a really long time, uh, probably since the beginning of governments. Um, and so, of course, this is something that many countries and in, indeed around the globe, uh, there have been efforts to try to ameliorate and to try to, uh, to change. Um, and one way we can look at that, we can compare countries based on how unequal women are treated in those countries. Uh, we do know just generally that gender equality does tend to go along with more economically developed countries, but that is not always the case. Um, so I use the UN's Gender Inequality Index for 2017. That's kind of the most recent data that's available in an easy to uh, use database. Um, and I just took all the countries that we have studied as part of our case studies in this class and arrayed them in order based on the UN's measure of their rank of global um, gender inequality. So they, the UN makes a gender uh, inequality index where zero is total equality, total parity. For example, no difference in uh, female and male mortality rates, no difference in their labor participation, etc. cetera. Um, and, and one here would be total inequality. And so uh, you can see a raid in order here. The United States is about in the middle of the countries that we've studied, um, certainly lower than some of the other countries where, uh, you know, that there are equivalent economic levels of development to. Um, this index, by the way, is based on three rather simple um, measures. There are also much deeper dives and, and other kinds of measures that we could use. So I use this one because it's easy to see and kind of understand and grasp quickly. Um, and it is completely comparable one country to another, but we might want to see other measures in there. But this index includes measures of reproductive health, which is one of the most important um, uh, sort of indicators of how women are treated is uh, is how much do women and uh, how much do women survive the process of uh, giving birth of pregnancy and birth um, and then uh, how what's the rate of adolescent birth because adolescent birth is medically more complex and more risky than um, than adult female birth. Um, so those are the two reproductive health measures, uh, labor force participation, and then representation in the legislature. Again, we're leaving out lots of things here in terms of uh, domestic violence and other things that definitely play into uh, women's equality, but this gives us a way to kind of compare countries. So I'd love for you guys to look up your country's gender inequality ranking and then um, list that on your uh, on the blackboard as one of your takeaways for this video. Um, so I've linked this so you don't have to Google to find it in the uh, in the 
folder on Blackboard for this week, there is a link. All you have to do is click on that black link um, and it will open up a table. And the second column to the right of the country name is what you're looking for. Um, on the left, it'll give you a ranking, what looks like a ranking, but those are actually, that's the more general human development ranking. Um, so be sure you're looking in the second column to the right of the country name. And, um, and you can check it pretty quickly because the United States is 41. So if you're, if you're in the right column, you'll see a number 41 for the United States. And look up your country and, um, and post and comment a little bit on that in, the, in Blackboard. Why do you think your country has the, the listing or the ranking that it does? So obviously gender empowerment is important in politics uh, as with racial and ethnic in, empowerment and lots of countries have seen social movements really growing up around women's political empowerment. So um, this is a picture from the 2017 annual or 2017 International Women's March. Uh, this is from Pakistan. Um, so that's an example on a global level, really, of, of an effort for, uh, you know, a social movement, uh, mass movement, we would call it, um, empowering, trying to empower women politically. Um, but unlike race and, and, and ethnicity, um, where we saw that often, um, with ethnicity at least, um, political parties sometimes develop out of those social movements, uh, based for ethnic ethnic based parties, um, but we don't see gender based political parties. Pretty much no country has a specific gender based political party. And really, um, a lot of uh, countries don't have one particular political party that represents women's point of view, even if it's not a gender based party. Um, and the reason, you know, researchers have looked at this, there's more about this in your textbook, um, but researchers basically argue that Unlike ethnicity, where ethnicity may be uh, tightly tied to other ways that a country is, um, other cleavages within a country that, that are naturally politically important cleavages, things like social class. Um, so if you have an ethnicity that is, that is um, consistently in the lower social classes or that is um, consistently in um, labor rather than management or something like that, uh, you would more naturally see political parties. But gender, of course, is a cross-cutting characteristic. And so, um, you know, women are in all ethnic groups, all social classes. Um, and so therefore, um, there may not be as many um, opportunities for political organization into a party. And I think we can see that, um, you know, especially in the United States where, uh, you know, to the extent that there have been successful women in politics, we've had women um, from the Republican and the Democratic parties. Uh, there have certainly been women um, over history who have uh, been more conservative and more um, uh, even reactionary in terms of even things that are considered to be women's issues. Right now, there's a there's a, uh, a movie out about Phyllis Schlafly in the United States. If you haven't heard of her, you might want to check out the film. Um, it's basically about um, the uh, a woman who was um, not in favor of the women's movement and actually um, strongly protested against it and led a social movement of women against uh, women's uh, liberation, as it was called in the 1970s. So, um, so gender is cross-cutting, which makes it difficult for um, a, a gender-based political party to be created or, or to be, or for gender groups, gender issues to be co-opted by political parties. Um, so a lot of, of women's political empowerment have hap has happened across the globe in terms of um, setting aside quotas for female legislative representation. Um, and there's really two ways that countries have done this. This is not something the United States has done, but something that many, many countries, about half the countries around the world have some sort of um, quota for uh, political representation. Um, so there are legal gender quotas that are about parliament um, in many countries where a certain number of seats or positions are set aside for women. Often it's 30%. Um, 
Um, here you see a picture of Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda actually has the highest percentage of female legislators in, in the world. Um, they have somewhere between 55 and 65 percent, um, depending on which year it's been. Um, and they specifically set aside at least 30 percent for women. Um, so that accounts for part of that, but not the whole of Rwanda's uh, success in terms of representing women. Um, some countries don't have legal quotas in the parliament, but they do have voluntary party quotas where political parties will agree that a certain percentage of their candidates will be women. This is called a candidate quota system rather than a reserve seat quota. Um, and sometimes these can really um, impact each other. You'll have one party um, that sets aside 30% of candidacies for women. And the next thing you know, the, uh, the arrival party will be trying to outdo that with 40 or 45% of, of seats or something, or of um, candidacies. Um, uh, quotas are also used in some countries and legislatures for ethnic minority representation. Um, actually, many countries that have, uh, that have sort of, um, uh, ethnic groups that are asking for nation uh, status or, or to be recognized for self-government um, are often pacified in some way by giving a quota of representation in the legislature for them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's not something we're used to as, as people in the United States. We're not used to thinking about these type of quotas as being appropriate politically, but uh, certainly many countries have. Uh, now, you know, there's a whole nother question about quotas, which is, do they actually improve? The, certainly they improve gender representation within the legislature. We know that for sure. That's absolutely true. Um, do they improve gender equality globally? Do they make it make conditions better for women? Um, you know, the jury's out on a on a definitive answer to that. I, I tried to put this little table together to show you um, which ones were, you know, the countries that we've studied and, and their rank on gender inequality. And then you can look and see whether they have party quotas or legal quotas. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, we can see the United States is higher ranked than a number of countries, Mexico and Brazil um, in particular, that do have, uh, you know, quotas for women's representation. So clearly it's not an automatic slam dunk. Um, but I think for some countries, uh, we would say the answer is yes. Certainly for R Rwanda, uh, which deliberately tried to increase uh, female representation after in the peace process after their horrible civil war um, the idea there was that women would help um, and and we have seen uh, you know improvements in things in Rwanda like uh, violence against women and things like that uh, but certainly there's there's a long way to go there for for women's parity so I guess the short answer would be uh, they can help, but they're certainly not a panacea or a or a cure all for women's inequality. There are many other things that are, that happen in to create an in, unequal system for women um, beyond just legislative representation. All right, that is the end of our video lecture, our very last video lecture for the course. Pat yourself on the back for all your hard work in learning in this online environment. Um, so now that you've watched both videos, be sure to post in our very last discussion board. Um, and remember for this discussion board, you wanna check out your country's gender inequality index uh, and be sure to post that uh, um, via that link on Blackboard. So it's been great learning alongside of you this semester. I'm gonna miss all of you. Um, this isn't the end of our class, certainly, but we have uh, next week will be your midterm exam, and then the final exam will be the week after that. Uh, so remember, uh, your study guide will be going up soon for the uh, for your uh, probably already is up by the time you watch this. Um, for your uh, midterm exam and good luck with all of that. You can contact me anytime by text, phone, or email. Take care, everybody.